it had no beginning or end. I, I really feel there's really only one real beginning and end in, in life, and that's pretty obvious what that is. And I, I, I it, when we remember stories, we can enter them at any point. We can come into them and go out of them at any point. We can take them apart, we can put them back together. They're objects in our mind. Um, they're malleable, they're, there's something that, I, I think there's no word for it necessarily, so that's what I was trying to get at here. So, um, I wanted to make a book that was, was bigger on the inside than it was on the outside as well. So it's partially inspired, this is Marshall Duchamp's Museum in a Box from 1935. Uh, for an artist who's generally typified as being incredibly cold and self-conscious and intellectual, this is such a warm piece of work, really. It's, uh, it just feels really exciting to me and very inviting. For, this is uh, basically his life's work put into sort of a salesman sample briefcase. He was very inspired by the artist Joseph Cornell, uh, who for better or for worse, I think, probably kept the flame of poetry alive in the visual arts in the 20th century. And personally, I feel was one of the greatest artists of the 20th century. There's a great collection of his work at the Art Institute in Berkman. Collection. This is another of his. And you can't imitate Joseph Cornell. You can try, but you just end up making sort of a, a cheesy Victorian uh, shadow box. There's something about his work that feels very eternal and, and seems to encompass all of life. I think it's really beautiful. When I finished the book itself, I wanted to make a model of the building that sort of tried to get at a little bit of how we can remember places that we've lived in in the round and you know, almost as a totality or something. So. This is a paper cut out that a sad, lonely reader could spend many days <laughs> frustrating himself over. <laughs> Down at the bottom there, there's little pieces of paper that kind of to pieces of the story that don't necessarily fit into it. So, um, this is a page from my, uh, I keep a diary, a comic strip diary, and this is from a few years back. Uh, just to kind of point at the difference between comic strip drawing and, uh, I guess, real drawing. I guess I wouldn't call this real drawing. It's certainly a good drawing, but it's an attempt to remember something, which to me, writing fiction in comics is not. Writing fiction in comics is creating something synthetic, so I try to draw in a very synthetic way. But um, drawing from life is trying to see and trying to feel something. So this is the building that I've lived in for a while in Chicago on which the building and building stories is sort of based on, um, however transmuted then into the form of, of uh, comics fiction, this is how I approach it. I want, the, I want the pictures to be almost invisible, something you see through, something almost that you can kind of squish your thoughts through in a way. Um, I don't want them to be inviting images, I don't want them to have a snap or even a visual appeal to them, I want them to communicate the image as quickly as possible. Uh, I generally don't take notes for stories. This is just a page of notes for a particular strip. Uh, pretty much everything I wrote down here, I don't even think went into the strip. Once I start drawing on a page, this is the beginning of a page here. The second I set, that's, can you see it at all? Oh, all right. um, once I set pencil to paper, everything starts to change. The second I draw a person on a paper, anybody who draws something, you can have hundreds of ideas. The second you start drawing, that's going to change. It's all going to go out the window when you see what's on the page in front of you. So, I don't know if you can see this at all. But, uh, anyway, as I work, the story sort of comes together, and then I do all the lettering. And then I draw all the figures in uh, using a brush and good old ink, which some of you may have heard of. And do all the backgrounds with the ruler, which uh, people seem to think I studied architecture, so I just use a ruler. I don't know anything about architecture at all. So like, the reason I keep all my lines straight up and down is because that's the way we see the world. I mean, it's sometimes in movies, movies move the camera around and stuff, but when you tilt your head, things don't move. Very fortunately, our brains accommodate uh, our movement of our bodies, so it's, I try to stay within the realm of memories. So. Anyway, and then I add in the color to try to make it look, look too terrible. For me, the color is more of how you see the lines are more about how you remember. So, at the same time, I realize it's a rather constipated way of working. My, my wife left me a note on the uh, kitchen table a week ago. It's just three words. It said, relax your asshole. <laughs> and she's right. 
this is my drawing table. I'm just including this because sometimes people want to see where people work. I work on the top floor of my house and right by three windows out which I can see the world and normal people walking by who I can look at. I know every single person who walks by my window, whether they know me or not, which just sounds kind of creepy. This is the beginning of my existence right here. This is the ruination of my life and I think everybody's life pretty much at this point. So a glowing screen that we can't get away from. So when I was a kid, I really wanted to be a superhero and I was stupid enough to think I would be a superhero when I grew up. I actually thought I'd grow muscles and everything. But even dressed up my Snoopy doll as a Batman doll. The thing that makes me mad is that all these movies now about superheroes that normal people go and see, like regular people who have families and lives and stuff. That's the stuff I got beat, beat up for reading when I was a kid, you know, so it just doesn't seem fair. So I wanted to grow up to make adult comics, and this is the finest example of it that probably will, I, mean, I can't imagine will ever be better at art. Art Spiegelman and Francois Mouly's Raw magazine, and of course, Mouse, which is the finest graphic novel ever published, and uh, I honestly don't think it'll ever be better. The amount of work and thought and intelligence that Art put into it, some of you I'm sure saw, not all of you saw the, the talk this morning on Art Ivan did. It's uh, a formidable achievement. So, and, uh, fortunately, Art is, um, I would consider, one of my greatest friends, greatest inspirations, and, and, and one of my life. So, also just to mention Anders Nilsson, who was here earlier, published by DNQ, I think is a, a fantastic cartoonist. This book, uh, Big Questions, was selected as one of the best books of the year by the New York Times. Uh, in this book, Don't Go Where I Can't Follow, is one of the most moving comics I think ever published. Um, I don't want to go into any details about that. And my uh, extraordinarily good friend, Ivan Brunetti, here. Um, I feel very lucky to know there's a reason why I have dinner with him every week. This new book, Aesthetics. Um, He's, uh, he's just a, a great a guy, and I, I wouldn't be able to live without him. And of course, everybody knows Lynn Jerry. So there's a, there's, a, there's a woman cartoonist who, I won't, no, I'll name her. Her name is Jessica Abel. Um, and she published an article in Art News Magazine titled, Why Are There No Great Women Cartoonists? Seems like a weird thing to say. So, um, so I wrote a letter into Art News and I said, well, I can think of at least one, and uh, that would be Linda. She, she, Linda's opened up the, the language of comics through what feels like autobiography, but is actually fiction, to a, a stream of consciousness and an inner voice that, that is along the lines of, of Faulkner, I think, or Virginia Woolf. I think she's a genius. So. This is a, a letter that she sent me in 1993, which to me is still one of the most uh, important letters I ever got. I was feeling really down on myself on the day I got this in my mailbox, and it kind of changed my life. So she's a very wonderful person. I'm very proud to be here with her. So finally, she said she was going to talk about some kids' drawings. This is my daughter Clara's drawing. I don't know if you can read it or not. It says, You're in love. And there's a guy with a goatee, and then an old lady with stringy gray hair, and then sort of a boneless cat on the pillow there. <laughs> these little uh, hearts over their heads. I said, who's this guy, Claire? And she said, uh, he's just a douche. <laughs> so, anyway, so that's it. Uh, <laughs>